Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. Hello. How are we doing? Good. Calvin Watkins, Dallas Morning News. Uh, you didn't have uh, Terp, so how did the, your return game look yesterday? A little bit different, but I thought Deuce did a great job of catching the ball, holding on to the ball. Decision making is always part of it. You know, there's one he probably could have returned that he fair caught, and there's one or two that he fair that he returned that he probably should have fair caught. So the decision making is a big part of it. But when you're dressed, you know, in Deuce's case, you want to make plays. So throwing a fair catch up there sometimes is hard when you don't have a lot of opportunities. And then uh, for kick return, Rico's in the back end. The only one we had was the short field kick. Um, but it was solid. Happy with the catching and the security. Decision making will come as experience grows. Talk about a lot of young guys that are playing a lot more. So how are you managing that, especially with special teams? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, Calvin. It's been probably more so through, what are we, nine games in, more kind of roster changes than I've experienced. As far as, you know, I'm losing, you know, go all the way back. I mean, CJ and Kelvin Joseph trade and Hender shot's been hurt and we lost Harper. Um, and then we've had the practice squad elevations, Malik Jefferson and Rashawn Evans, you know, he's out. So, um, but it's given opportunities to a lot of guys. You know, Jalen Brooks played again yesterday and did a great job. And Tyrus Wheat, you guys might not even know, but he's been playing every snap on all four phases. Um, Sean McEwen, Schoonmaker's been good. Chauncey Golson has been in there. But I mean, it's, it's puzzle pieces every week that we kind of just put in there. And our practices, you know, are so crucial. And our guys know that because the scout team reps they get, you know, matter for when they might have to fill in. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a very fun challenge, but it's been very unique on game day with, you know, very rarely a, a back-to-back lineup that's been consistent, which is good. Uh, Sagi, so the athletic, um, the offense after the first turnover, then the, the defense forces a punt, then you guys have a three now. That punt from Brian, just you know, how I guess important is it that at that stage of the game to pin them down deep again, and and how much practice goes into something. Yeah, good call. I think those were two critical things. You know, they, they started at the one because of the turnover on downs by us, got the ball back and had a punt again and, you know, made two of their drive starts at the one and the six with the punt on the second one. And that's crucial, you know, especially when our defense is kind of feasting and the offense, you know, the, the field position gives us an edge. Um, and it's, we practiced it a ton. So when the offensive and defensive players on Wednesdays are in meetings, myself, Anger, Aubrey and Trent will go into the indoor when it's available and we'll, we'll punt and kick for about an hour on Wednesdays just on our own. All kinds of situational kicking, situational punting. And then on Thursday, it's kind of a work day with the rest of the team. But we get a lot of undercover work in on Wednesday where we go through all kinds of unique situations or just the bread and butter. Uh, but a lot of work goes into it. You know, and when, you, and when you nail it, you know, you put the ball out of bounds at the six yard line. It's like, yes, you know, we did that on Wednesday. And man, that's why, that's why that's so important. Uh, th- that one went out of bounds, but I'm curious, what are you coaching the guys that are running down there? Are, are, you, are you telling them to c- get around and get to the goal line and turn around? I mean, what, what, what are their job descriptions of that? Yeah, you talking about the gunners? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no problem sharing the information on that because um, I won't say exactly what we do, but. I'd say around the league, you have two gunners, and any time a ball is being punted with a line of scrimmage that is inside the 50, one of the gunners is responsible for fronting the returner, and one of the gunners is responsible for going behind the returner to protect the goal line. A lot of times, the, re- the gunner that's responsible for fronting the gunner, if a fair catch goes up, you'll see that gunner go behind, and two men protect the goal line. So um, that's what just about all gunners do in different assignment forms or fashions. Um, so there is some strategy to protecting the goal line, but also protecting against a return or being there to recover a muff. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I know maybe it looks like you know just 11 bodies just running wild out there. Like there's there's no method to any of the madness, but there is. Um, and that's a great question because that's kind of an unusual. We call it a sky ball. You know, inside the 50, you're trying to down it inside the 10, ideally, but anywhere in that range is is a good spot. So you saw Sam track the returner because he didn't call for a fair catch. So his job is to make sure that the ball doesn't get returned and Jalen Brooks run behind it to protect the ball from going into the end zone. Sorry. Uh, Joseph Voigt, uh, Lone Star Live. You mentioned last week how rewarding it is to see special teams guys make an impact on offense and defense. Jalen Brooks had his first career catch this week. That's awesome. Uh, first, how rewarding was that? And this might be a stretch, but do you remember the first time you were really cognizant of how rewarding it was as a special teams coach to see that happen? 
Ooh, good one. Yeah. Um, it was awesome. Last week, Jalen Tolbert got his first touchdown, you know, and Jalen Brooks got his first catch. And I was right on the sideline, and I knew it. And I was like, yeah, JB. Um, the first time, gosh, um, to see a guy really go from special teams to offense and defense, I have to go. Um, one of the big ones we had was when I was with the Rams, Corey Littleton was an undrafted linebacker. Um, and he was really sensational for a year or two, made the Pro Bowl. And then Mark Barron got hurt, who's a starting linebacker, and he filled in. And for the next year and a half, he started a linebacker. Then, you know, that was one that was memorable. But there's a lot of them. I, it's probably hard to just pick the first one out or even the best one out because they're all really cool. Um, it's a great question. I'll, maybe next week I'll have a better answer. <laughs> Does that feeling ever get old for you? <sighs> Absolutely not. It probably gets even better. Just knowing that it's how it's supposed to be. In my opinion, I'm a special teams coach, but you know, freshmen in college, I think, should be on special teams and grow towards bigger roles on O and D. And NFL, I think everybody, you know, it doesn't matter the draft pick or the undrafted, you know, special teams should be part of their fabric getting started. And then, you know, they stay with that or else they grow into offense and defense. I think it's just a great way to get started in the NFL is to create a role for yourself. Get your cleats on and play on game day. Get dirty, get banged up a little bit, and then you know see where it goes from there. But um, I love it. It's, it's my favorite part of the job is you know getting the young guys, giving them a role, and then seeing where they go from there. Whether it's special teams for their career or you know most likely you know offense and defense later on. But it's cool. Good, cool. Good observation, man. They love for Cowboys Radio. Um, so John, they were backed up the one time, and I know for them it's protection first, and it appeared you guys had a pump block on and do kind of put himself in harm's way a little bit. Do you ever give him the edict or give the returner the edict that, hey, we're, just, we're going after it, fair catch it because we're not protecting for you, or is that always at the discretion of the returner? Yeah, it's the first one, I think the ball hit the ground on a shorter punt, and the second one, he moved up and caught it. Um, it's, yeah, it's always at the discretion of the returner um, and how much information, you know, when. When, let's just say teams rush, sometimes you have a good opportunity to return the football if the punt protection pocket gets kind of annihilated. So sometimes the goal returning the football is to, is to rush. Sometimes it's to hold up. I mean, it's, but I think it really comes down to decision making with the returner if it's a ball that he can cleanly catch and get an opportunity to run, whether it's a rush or return. So there's no edict for the returner to um, fair catcher to get away from it based on a call, just based on the punt and what threat he feels from the gunners. Was this, that a situation where you said, hey, you might want to fair catch at home? <laughs> nope. No, <okay>. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. I think uh, sometimes I've learned is right or wrong. If I try to tell a guy, you know, hey, you should fair catch it, you know, be, just be ready to fair catch it, then you get a returnable ball and you're like, oh, damn, I shouldn't, you know, and then you know, you tell them not to fair catch it. And uh, it gets confusing back there sometimes when I try to overcoach, I guess. Yeah. Brad. Uh, Brad Shan, Cowboys Radio Bones. Two things. Um, looked like you were inviting them to return kickoffs a couple of times. Was that uh, strategic or just to practice cover kickoffs? And uh, number two, <clears throat> excuse me, on anger, statistics aside, how would you compare the year he's having to the Pro Bowl year that he had two years ago? That's a good call. First, first question with the kickoffs. Um, we were trying to put a little more hang time on it. We didn't want to give him a returnable ball necessarily. Um, but we want to put a little hang time on it and kind of see where their range was and tempt them a little bit just to get some work on cover because we haven't covered put one kickoff now too. Um, so that was, you know, the goal wasn't to put every ball in play for sure. But if they wanted to bring one out, we needed to get some work. And we got, we got some work on the one. Um, pretty good return by them and little things uncovered by us, but nothing either way. Um, and then Brian Anger compared to his Pro Bowl year, which was two years ago, um, I'd say either he's right on par or better this year than he was his Pro Bowl year. Just with what we've been asking of him with our, our punt team has changed significantly and a lot of new pieces and growing pieces. So he's been asked to do maybe even more precise punting than he did two years ago. And I think he's really doing a good job of that. Um, 
especially like on the skyball kicks, the one he put out. That's where I think his biggest area of improvement needed to be is those inside the 50 rugby balls where you want the backspin instead of the kick where it goes into the end zone. So that's been some good stuff by him. So I'm looking forward to the next you know, eight regular season games to see if he can continue to improve. But that's what I would say. I think he's a notch better, if anything. Mike McGilkin, Dallas Morning News. Your specialist, that full battery, is, is very strong. But the way that you guys built that battery, there, were, there was no draft capital spent at all. It's workouts, it's scouting the USFL, it's, it's kind of doing some of that grinding work to, to, to bring him here. What are your thoughts just about the process of assembling the group that you have and how, you know, kind of looking in, in some maybe unexpected places yeah. or less obvious places in order to, to bring them here? Yeah, no, cool, Michael. I'm glad you asked that. I think. If I, hopefully, I can be allowed to do this, but I want to give a big shout out to the USFL. Honestly, I mean, we got two huge, talk about the, the returner as a part of the battery. I think of, you know, that and USFL, you know, gave Terp an opportunity. And because of that, you know, we got him here. Um, the USFL gave Brandon Aubrey an opportunity. And because of that, we got him here. So just any of those other leagues, opportunities for coaches and players to just play and get some film out there has given these guys great chances. So thank you to the USFL. And I was thinking about this last week, actually. Um, the USFL also gave my dad an opportunity. You know, in 1984, he was on the Stanford University staff that got fired after this, a couple years after the Stanford Cal banned on the field game. And so he was looking for a job in the New Orleans Breakers in the USFL in 1984, I believe, hired my dad. So. I go way back with USFL opportunities. That's why, you know, the Aubrey and the Turpin, um, the USFL is part of my growing up, you know. So the Norm Breakers hired my dad in 1984 and gave him an opportunity to, to coach professional football for one year. And off of that, he got hired as a head coach at the University of Utah. And without that, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> no, I sure don't know where he would have been. But um, so I started to veer away from your question, but it's a little bit personal, to be honest with you. Um, so, yeah, putting it together, a USFL returner, a USFL kicker, you know, Trent got cut by the Raiders, who I had known because we played against them multiple times. So I had a write up on him in our scouting department, you know, really liked him. And so to, to nab him right away was huge. Um, Brian Anger was, you know, on the street when we signed him to a, a rookie deal for one year. And um, so all these guys are, what's the common denominator? They're hungry, you know what I mean? This guy got cut, this guy's on the street. These two guys had to go to the USFL for a chance. And so um, there's something inherent about just having to fight and work and be the underdog. And um, that's a cool way, I think, to put together specialists. You know, nobody's spoiled um, and everybody's still fighting for something, kind of probably like their special teams coach. Did those, uh, maybe at some level, did you actually move to New Orleans for that year? We did, we moved from San Jose to New Orleans for the year. Utah, five years there. Yep. For you growing up, how were those experiences at those places that if not for USFL, you wouldn't have been maybe at either, yeah. at the, certainly at that time, what, what sort of impact did they have on you? Yeah, incredible. I mean, I was 10 when we moved from San Jose to New Orleans in fifth grade. And uh, give me another shout out. Let me shout out to my mom. Cause, because my mom, you know, I had, I got, you know, three brothers and a sister. She made it cool to move everywhere. You know, we didn't have to do nothing except, you know, she got the school taken care of. She got the house taken care of. Uh, we just happened to be a new city and new friends. And so that's kind of the way my whole family grew up as we moved every couple of years. But um, yeah, just growing up in football was the best because, you know, we moved from Weber State to Utah, to Stanford, to New Orleans, back to Utah. Then um, after he got fired at University of Utah, I'm talking about my dad, you know, a year later he got hired the New York Giants as an assistant coach. And so the the traveling just kept going and mom took care of business, dad took care of business and, you know, me and my siblings took care of business, but, you know, it was taken care of for us. So um, just a football life adventure, which has been real cool. And I just, you know, to be in the meeting rooms and kind of pay forward some of the, some of the knowledge, especially when things are a little bit tough, you know, you know, a guy gets cut or a guy, we just get picked up like, hey, welcome home, man. You're good. Come on, come on in here and, you know, make this home for you and see what you can do with it. So. There's a lot of stuff Monday through Saturday that is kind of underground that isn't always football. It's just trying to keep everybody on the same path for a, a hell of a long season. Did you see 
seem like you have a, uh, we've been around each other for a few years, I think everyone would say in this room, like you have a very positive demeanor, temperament, attitude about things. You talk about moving a lot as a kid and it kind of just being easy for the family because of your mom. Do you think that helped shape that in some way where for some kids moving would be you know, borderline traumatic because you got all your friends yeah. and you're yeah. not going to see them again, yeah. but that you guys kept it positive, is that something of a defining experience for you? Yeah, for sure. And I think it has everything to do with how my mom and dad handled the moving, you know, just to keep it like normal, you know, and um, get us into the sports and get us into, you know, good schools and there wasn't ever any time, you know, my dad moved by choice or not by choice. You know, there, there wasn't any choice for the rest of us. We were moving. It's not like, hey, dad's going to go when we're going to stay here because we like the school and we like the city and dad will come back when he can. Um, so that was just part of the deal. Dad's moving. We're all moving. And there wasn't any option. So I was like, okay, here we go. You know, when um, I got three daughters, but when I moved from L.A. to Dallas, um, just had a two daughters and one was a baby and we told our kids and said, hey kids, we're, uh, I think there were eight and six at the time, said, hey, we're moving to, to Dallas. You know, my, my middle one broke down crying. She ran screaming out the door and my eight-year-old started running around celebrating like, ha, ah, you know. <laughs> so don't, we're coming, you know, here we go. So um, I just think back when I was those ages, you know, just with my kids and we've moved a lot too, you know, hopefully <laughs> we don't have to do that for a while. But, but eventually probably have to, and so pack up, and here we go. And um, yeah, it's cool to look back. Sorry to get, you know, talk too much and make it personal. But, but it kind of is sometimes, you know. Football is very personal sometimes. Um, yeah. Justin Marks, the Football Network. Um, Brian was talking earlier about Cooper Rush and how he has to take these mental reps and really be locked in during the game, especially since he doesn't always get opportunity because Dak so is very hungry to get those reps during yeah, practice. Yeah. I'm curious to see how you do that and how you handle that with um, guys like Deuce Vaughn who have to take over for Cavante and how Terp's obviously hungry for those reps as well. How do you handle that with someone like Deuce in weeks like this? Yeah, that's a good call. The biggest thing we do is whenever we're on one phase, we have a scout team that's running the other phase. You know, for our punt return, we have a scout punt team. And we tell all of those guys, you are the Cowboys punt team. So use our technique, do our thing. And so really on one rep, we're getting 22 reps, you know, of guys. And that's about the limit of our, our squad anyway. So Deuce has plenty of chances to catch balls from Brian. Uh, we get a ton of post-practice work. And then, you know, the, the professionals in the building, they can learn a lot by watching film. So um, it's not only hands-on, it's also film watching. And um, yeah, we, we spread the reps around, I think, pretty darn good. You get everybody work, especially, you know, especially the scout team guys. Um, this past week, you know, we didn't have a lot of action against the Giants. You know, we got two penalties. We've got to clean up on field goal block. But our scout team was outstanding. Malik Jefferson, Malik Davis, Sheldrick Redwine gave us some great looks. And I'm pointing those guys out because the Giants had a very unique punt. You know, they ran some overload, overload, shield, you know. And we just got great looks by those guys. And um, they work hard against each other. And we have five things we talk about in practice. I won't give you the first four, but the fifth one is thank your teammate for making you better. That's a big thing for us in practice. And so it's part of competing against each other. If you get your butt kicked, you know, don't be mad about it. Like, thank him for making you better. And um, that's how we try to keep sharpening ourselves in practice. Um, I think we'll keep getting better. Thanks for Scott or Dave. Yeah, Scott is with the AP. Um, the proverbial nine iron punt. Kind of going back to when you and I were growing up, it seems like back then, and before you were a coach, and maybe it's just the way, just being nice, kind of unsophisticated, you would think when somebody punted it inside the 10, you're like, you're just hoping it bounces the way you want to bounce. But it seems like today it's a lot more intentional with yeah. punters and punts like that. Is that true? Was it? Did that kind of evolve over time where the science of it got to where guys could basically make the ball do what they wanted to do? Yeah, I'm with you. I think it used to be more like spiral ball, coffin corner. They didn't have the ability to put that kind of backspin, kickback rotation on it. And I don't know when that started, if it was the Charger punt, I think it was Bennett. Yeah, Bennett. Yeah, yeah, maybe 20 years ago, he brought the Aussie style punting in. And then a lot of guys have started to incorporate that. Not only Australian punters, but American punters. You know, that's inside the 50, you're seeing a lot of the Aussie style punts. Now you're seeing some, some helicopter punts. And so, 
the punting skill has, I think, gone way up, even in the last decade. You got to have a couple of different, you know, tricks up your sleeve as a punter. Not tricks, but, you know, a couple of different kicks to make it hard for returners to catch some of those balls. And so I think your pointers, I would agree with you, the last 10 years, the ability of punters to make that ball bite on an inside the 50 punt has been pretty, pretty, pretty good. John, I, I have a follow up to the question that, that, I, that pertains to the question I'm about to ask, but the two leverage penalties. It's kind of unusual to get two of those in one yeah. game. What, what happened with those? Yeah, they were, they were good calls for sure. Um, nothing intentional or malicious by it was Sam Williams on one and Chauncey Golston on another. Um, most, a lot of times in, in field goal protection, guys are kind of staying low to kind of cut the quads out of the rushers. And both calls, we had a guy swimming a gap. And when they went to swim the gap, they kind of got their legs cut out from underneath them. And so they naturally kind of protected themselves by putting a hand down and then ended up going over the top. So I got some work this week, you know, cut out to just talk about, you know, how to, how to try to penetrate versus kind of getting, not cut, but kind of getting your quads cut out without leveraging. So that will be, that'd be a good project for me this week, teaching the guys how to, how to be a factor on how to block a field goal, but also protect your legs, but also not get a leverage, leveraging penalty. So. And, and then the follow-up, obviously, they, they kick off from the 50. So are you on high alert at that point? I mean, I know the game was out of hand at the yep, last yep. Game, but are you on high alert for an onside kick? Absolutely. Yeah, we moved all eight bodies up, crowding the, restrict, the restraining line. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of potential in play there for a lot of different things. Absolutely surprised on side, based on the score, too, and the field position. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.